A little bit about myself. Um, if you haven't seen me speak before, I'm Paul Hunt. Um, I now work for Trustmark. We were originally Trinity, we've been taken over. Um, so we're part of Liberator Trustmark division. Um, Trustmark are a large account reseller. And we're now part of their services organisation. Um, I do blog reasonably heavily. Um, normally when I've got something good to say about SharePoint, I don't like to blog incessantly just for the sake of seeing my own name up there. Um, I am on Twitter at Kimrus and you'll recognise my picture around on Twitter and Facebook and various places. I tend to stick with the same one. Um, I've been part of the SharePoint community since 2007. Uh, when I first came into SharePoint, I didn't know anything about it. It was the first time I loaded the product. You know, I did click, 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 next. Excellent, I've got SharePoint installation. Um, I look back now at some of the stuff I did then and think, oh my God. Um, so I, I'm, I'm back in the community to come back and sort of, you know, tell people what I did wrong, help people learn from those mistakes and uh, kind of give back, because I absolutely leached information from the community back then. Um, I'm a co-organiser for the Sub UK, so the SharePoint User Group London. Um, if you haven't ever been to a SharePoint user group meeting, it's very much like the Evo conference, you get some good speakers. Most of the speakers here today and for the next couple of days, they've, uh, they've all been at user group meetings as speakers. Um, and in my spare time, I'm a wood turner, which is as completely removed from IT as you can get um, for a very good reason. It's my, it's my sanity, that is. This is a very difficult session to pitch because there's some elements of development, there's some elements of IT Pro configuration and very much end user. Um, so I like to think of this session as a blue touch paper. You know, I want to spark some ideas in you. This isn't how you should build a forms catalog in any shakes. You know, I want you to go away from here, perhaps with one or two ideas that you can take back to your own deployments. Um, if you come out of here with one thing, I'll be happy. If you come out with more than that, excellent, that's a bonus. Um, so our agenda today, we're going to run through the business problem from the client's perspective. Um, we're going to talk about why we chose Office 365 for the solution. Um, we're going to talk about the chosen design, the foundations we need to build that de design, how we've deployed it into Office 365, which is a burning question for quite a few people. Um, we're going to talk about how we, the demos will bring it all together and we'll actually show you how we build it. Um, and then we'll, not so much a review, but Q&A. We are not covering InfoPath Forms replacement. If you're expecting answers, <laughs> if you're expecting answers on what's coming after InfoPath, we don't know. Um, I don't think there's any gold partner that can turn around and tell you, oh yes, this is coming next, because I don't think Microsoft know. Um, what I can say is InfoPath is supported in SharePoint v Next, which means, okay, the client will be going out of support, but the server element will remain in support for some time. So, you know, if the business requirements say you need InfoPath, personally, I'd recommend InfoPath. Um, at the end of the day, it does come down to your business requirements. So, the business problem for my client was this. They weren't using typewriters. They were using an aging legacy forms application. Um, this, this application had been around probably about eight or nine years. It was written pre.net. So that kind of gives you an idea of how old it was. Um, very costly to maintain. They had to go to the developers for everything they wanted to do. If a user wanted a new form, they used to sketch it out in Word or Paint or whatever, send it to the developers, then the developers would mock something up and then it would come back to the user. And that, that whole life cycle of creating forms was just painful. So people stopped doing it. So a lot of the forms on the system were out of date. But then managing those forms and actually making them available to the users was even more onerous. Again, developers were needed to remove a form from the list. You know, it was a very web-driven, like early web-driven interface. Um, so yeah, it, it was just a rigid old system. You couldn't upgrade it. I mean, you couldn't upgrade that typewriter other than put a new ink in it. <clears throat> so we also had the business requirements. Now, a lot of the requirements came from the legacy application. Um, because they said, oh, well, it always used to do this. So when we're going through these kind of requirements gathering um, sessions, it's nice to try and sometimes challenge those behaviours. Um, so these were kind of what we came up with in the end. So the solution had to be flexible and easily adopted by the business. So the driver for this one is very much the, you know, stuff went out of date too quickly. So they wanted a way to be able to quickly update forms, make changes, and not be reliant on the developer lifecycle. 
Um, it needed to be capable of handling multiple form types. You know, they had some forms on the old system that they printed out, they signed. They still had some very old business processes that needed someone to print out a document, wander over to another department, have someone sign it. You know, it's not like we can do that electronically now, is it? Um, so there was, there was a lot of sort of print and send, and there was some online submissions um, and external surveys and things like that. And there was a lot of things that they couldn't do in the old application that had... So things like SurveyMonkey, you know, SurveyMonkey has come up in, um, in the last few years as one of the sort of primary exterior, uh, external survey tools, but they couldn't connect to that. Um, so it needed to be managed by the business and reduce uh, reliance on suppliers. So as a gold partner, obviously I'd love them to keep coming back to me every time they need a form, um, they're not going to. Um, they wanted a catalogue of forms. So the one thing that the old legacy application did well is it did present a nice catalogue of forms. You know, they could go to the HR department, they could see all the HR forms, they could sort of search. Search was okay in the system. The one thing they couldn't do was have a team view. So they wanted to have private forms that were for use within the team only. So things like the IT guys would have requisition forms that would go off to a particular company. And they didn't want the rest of the companies to be able to see those. Um, but they, so they couldn't put that kind of form into this central system. The other thing, along with the requirements, is all of your requirements should align to a business vision. Now, my client's business vision, or one of their vision statements, was to do more with technology, making the most of their investments. Um, and you'll see why that really applies to Office 365 for them. So the decision for Office 365 was uh, the ability to handle all the different form types. So we could put InfoPath in there for now, for quite a long time now. Um, Word, there is rumour that Word forms are going to improve very soon. So I'm looking forward to seeing what comes from that. Um, SharePoint lists, Excel surveys, if you're putting them in OneDrive. Um, I'm kind of hoping SharePoint, uh, Excel surveys are going to work properly in SharePoint at some point. We'll see. Um, custom applications, it's all about the apps in SharePoint now. Third party forms, so Nintex, K2. I should have put more than just one name there. I'm not affiliated to Nintex or anything. Every form provider has their pros and cons. Um, and of course, mid tier development. So, for those of you doing jQuery, um, there's Form 7 from Mark Rackley, who's speaking here at the conference. It's quite a nice, interesting JavaScript based form technology. Um, also, with Office 365, we can do some simple client-side customization. So we're going to look at some of these in a short while. So things like display templates to change the look and feel, um, the search that's built in, we can again, we can change the look and feel and behaviors of search. And there's that enterprise class search engine that we can build on. And the other key one for Office 365, they already had it. You know, there's a lot of companies out there that are rolling out Exchange into Office 365 and they're kind of forgetting that you know, they've got SharePoint. They've got Link, they've got all these other technologies sitting there. You know, I see as a, as a Gold Partner, we're seeing a lot of drivers for people to move to 365 just for exchange initially. And then they think, oh, hang on, well, we're, we're paying all this money and we've got SharePoint sitting there doing nothing. It's exactly what was happening at this client. They, they'd initially gone in for the AD licensing and exchange and SharePoint was kind of an afterthought. They were happy with their on-prem, but there was a lot of benefits for them to moving some of that old, again, aging legacy infrastructure. You know, SharePoint 2010 for them is starting to creak. They'd, they were a very early adopter. Um, they started during the beta phase of 2010, and they were ready to start moving forward. So there was a, a, a real big conversation there about, you know, do we go to 2013 on-prem, or do we start moving to Office 365? Um, as it happens, they're now looking at going to hybrid, because there are some workloads that they don't want to put into the 365. But the key thing is, they've already invested so there's already this platform there that's capable of doing what they needed. So just going back, and this, sorry, this ties in with their vision statement, making the most of an investment that they've already made. So they've already invested very heavily in 365. So you know, this ties in, and that's a great conversation. If you're having that with a CFO or a CEO, you're saying, you know, if you can push something and say, this aligns with your business vision. Because generally, you're, the C-level are all tied on what have you done that aligns with the business vision? You know, that's their kind of goals and targets. So that's a good conversation to have. So our chosen design, um, we basically formed around a, having a local form manager list in each site. 
Um, so this was basically a, a list item that described the form. Um, we used content types and display templates to um, display those. We're using an enterprise level roll up, so we're using some metadata navigation to control the catalog. And we're using content by search to deliver that. By doing the local form, we were able to then also do things like local security. So we could put forms into a folder and have that just for the local team. Um, we could turn on and off the ability to display them in the enterprise catalog that everyone could see. Um, so yeah, the enterprise level roll up, we use metadata navigation, content by search. We're going to look at these in quite depth. Um, and we can do some search enhancements. So we're not just going to do a, a catalogue of forms. We're going to look at how do we make changes to our search, ent our enterprise search site to kind of bring forms to the fore. Um, and again, this is going back to lighting ideas. I want to show you ways that you can use search to your benefits to kind of push the information to the users that you think they need to know. There's a lot of analytics behind search that you can use to help steer some of these projects. Um, so our design is going to touch three areas in SharePoint Online. We're going to start with our team sites. Then we're going to create a, an enterprise form site. And this is going to be our catalogue of forms. And then we're going to enhance the search environment. So to do all of this, we do need some foundations, some building blocks. Um, I wanted to put the building blocks of the solution, but it didn't fit the title. So we've got foundations. Um, so we're going to start with content types. Um, content types are a very powerful way in SharePoint that we can use to define information and, and vary the behaviours and, and the information that we're storing for these. Um, so for my, my mock-up here, we've got a Evo form entry base item. So this base item is our parent content type. We're using this to define all of the fields that every form is going to have. We can then use child content types, so for instance the access form, Excel survey, if we need to vary any of those behaviours or vary the information stored, then we can base that on a content type. So what the users will see is they can create a new form entry and they can choose, I'm going to do a new access form, a new Excel survey. And all they need to know is understand is what information they'll need to put into that item. So there's a little bit of end user training, but it's fairly simple. So the content type gives us the ability to change our render patterns. So this is the particular use I was using here. Um, so I wanted to display a different icon for the different content types. So if you choose an access form, you get an access icon. If you choose an in-text form, you get the in-text icon. Um, so it's just a selection there. So I'm not going to dig too deeply into the HTML. It's literally just a decision statement that says, what content type is it? If so, do this. So it's nice and simple. It's, it's not earth-shattering development, any of this. So to build our content types, we, of course, need site columns. Um, so we've got some simple columns in there. We've got a couple of hyperlink fields for our URLs. Um, we've got a form classification. So this is our, for our managed metadata. And this is quite key for our enterprise catalog going forward. Uh, we've got our publish this form to the enterprise. So this is the decision point. Do you want this in the catalog or not? So we can, we can aim our search around that to only include those items that are published. Um, there's a couple of other ones. So refresh parent on form close. If you were doing a, um, a list form, and you were using this locally, then you might want to refresh the page, depending on how you were surfacing the forms. Um, for our scenarios today, that's not actually going to have a, a lot of behaviours for us. Um, the last one there is target behaviour, which was a choice field, which says, do I want this in a modal dialogue, do I want this in a new window, or do I want this in the same window? So three simple behaviours there. Um, I prefer to use modal dialogues where possible. I, I like the user experience. You know, they're not leaving the page they were on. They're, they're getting a chance to go and do something without losing that context of where they were. Um, so the other thing about using site columns is Office 365, actually and SharePoint on-prem, takes away the effort for us because we don't need to go and now create our managed properties like we did in 2010. You get the site collection, so the uh, site content types, site columns create their managed properties directly. Um, so you just need to understand some of the name formatting. So you'll get this OWS text at the end of a text field. You'll get URL, OWS, URL, H, and there'll be another one. Um, the URL, H is the one I wanted for our particular information. Um, Checkboxes, you get the CHCS. Um, the only ones that are slightly different are your taxonomy fields, where you'll actually get this OWS tax ID form. Uh, sorry, form classification was our title of our field. So you'll get this OWS tax ID, which denotes it as a managed metadata field. 
So those are all set up for you in search, which means that we can use them in our display templates. We can use them um, for our search queries. They're all there and available for us. You as an end user or an IT pro don't have to go and set this up anymore. We're also going to use a managed metadata term set. So I've got a very simple classification. It probably doesn't show very clearly. Um, so we've got three key business areas. We've got business services, production, and warehousing, I think. And we've got under there, we've got finances, expenses, and payroll. So we've got this nice hierarchy of the business. Um, and that's really what the managed metadata is. If anyone's not familiar with managed metadata, it's basically a hierarchical data descriptor. You, know, you can have this whole idea of parents and children. Um, and the beauty about that is when you're doing things like search or list refinement, you can click on a parent and it will select all the children for you. Gone are the days when you had sort of choice fields and you, you kind of did your own hierarchy. The problem with that is if you pick the parent, you didn't get the children. The key thing for us is we can use this now for navigation. So you're going to see this in the Enterprise Form site where we actually wire in our left-hand navigation to the classification. So when you pick a, a like business services, you're going to get all the forms related to business services. Finally, we're going to have our SharePoint list items. Um, and I think probably the key distinction to understand is when we talk about this form manager list, it's an item describing a form. It's not the form itself. So this item contains the URL of the form, the behavior to use when displaying that form, and we're going to look at using things like the content type, as I said, to derive the behaviors. And the key one is we categorize our form. So uh, one of the good things here is if you're building this form, for instance, in the IT site, you can set a default value to categorize the form as IT. The user can then override that because you might have an HR form sitting in the IT site for some reason, depending on your business process. But at least you can start by pre-categorizing those forms. Um, and we're going to look at using display templates just to change some of the form and function. Um, we're not going to use them heavily. It's, it really is just to change a display. Um, one of the key things I wanted to do for this demo is to mimic the getting started behavior in 2013. So you're all familiar with this. So we're going to see how we create this as our form manager. Um, I'm not a designer. I'm a, I'm a developer architect. Um, yeah, so I've stolen an, an image. So to do all of this, we've got some deployment options. So we're talking about Office 365 now. Um, so if you're doing this on-premise, you can uh, obviously use your local PowerShell. Um, you can obviously sit and create your content types manually um, in every site collection. I, I made a statement during my session in Belgium at the weekend that said, if you deploy a content type to more than two site collections manually, you're an idiot. And I'm going to stand by that. Um, even in Office 365, there are options for making sure that this is done accurately. If you do these manually, you will have human error. Now, the big problems is um, we're going to talk in a little while about the internal name. If you get your column names wrong initially and go and edit them afterwards, it makes no difference. For display templates and what we're doing in search, that column is wrong forevermore. Um, you actually have to then delete it and recreate it. So rather than um, doing these things manually, we want to look at doing uh, automated. So Content Type Pub is an, is an option. One of the problems with the Content Type Pub for me is, in, certainly in Office 365, is this hour timer job. Um, I'm a consultant. I get paid to spend time on site and deliver solutions. If I'm sat there for an hour like this, and kind of, what are you doing? I'm waiting for the timer job. It's not really the best uh, sort of light to be seen in. The other downside to that, to the content type hub, is you have no control over where those content types go. Once you build a content type in the content type hub, it goes to every site collection. Um, for the form manager, that doesn't make sense. I mean, I'm, I'm sending a big block of content types. So there's, I think there was 11 or 12 in this demo site. In the client site, there was actually a lot more. Um, by using the, a scripted option, we've actually got more control over where these go. Um, one of the beauties about this as well, and I've proved it with this demo, um, is that you can repeat this across environments just by making some minor changes to your scripts. Um, so I've built this session across four tenancies. So there was my initial dev tenancy where I was playing with the ideas. Then I took those ideas and put them into a, a mock-up site. Um, now, you've only got 30 days to play with Office 365, so that mock-up site lasted 30 days, and 
then things started breaking. So I moved to another mock-up site. And then finally I moved into the one that actually expires in five days. Um, but that's the one we're going to be playing with today. Um, so we're looking at scripting using PowerShell. Um, there's a few extra things we need for PowerShell. We need the, uh, the client-side object model DLLs. Um, so these slides will be available afterwards, but that link there will take you straight to the download. Um, I have been told, though, that they're also on the Patterns and Practices site, and they get updated a lot more often from, through GitHub. So you might be better going through there. Um, we're going to use a PowerShell script to control all of this, and we're going to use a config XML file. Um, so all we're doing here is we're basically going to have a little file that just says the name of the tenancy, the content types we're creating. We're going to pull that into the PowerShell and push that into Office 365. So that config XML, um, I don't know how clear that is for you guys. Um, basically, we've got a little bit of information about the tenant. We've got the manage metadata, the, the classification, and the term set. Now, I've already created the classification and term set, but in the scripts that I'll make available on my blog after this session, there's also the, bit, the scripts I use to import my data into 365, so you can see there how to build um, term sets on the fly using PowerShell. Um, I would say that it's not production code. It's been built for the demo. Um, so obviously temper and test it accordingly. Uh, we've got a little information about our site collection that we're pushing into. Um, and then after that is the site columns. Um, so we're describing the site columns basically using the same fields that we've pushed into the script. Into, um, to push a site column into Office 365, you build up an XML that basically describes the column. And these are the fields that are going in. Um, now, I've highlighted avoid name pane. If anyone's ever seen my display template session, you'll know that I will wax lyrical for ages about internal name pane, um, which is something that's been around with SharePoint for, well, since I've been with SharePoint. Um, and this goes back to when I said, when you create a site, co uh, site column, or create any column name, it will use that column you create as the internal name. If you've got spaces in that name, it will encode them. So you'll have, so if this was Evo space form space URL, you'd have Evo underscore X. I'm seeing some nods here, yeah, 0020 underscore, which is great until you have two columns very similar. Um, and then if you've got two columns that hit the length boundary, it just sticks a zero on the end, which is, you know, as you can see, when you're getting to start with doing display templates and search properties, that can be really hard to control. So one of the things we can do for our scripts is we can control, so we can create the name and the display name separately. Now when you do that in the PowerShell, there is a particular fit option we need to set, and I will highlight that as well. Um, so how many have we got any devs in the room? A couple of devs. IT pros comfortable with PowerShell? No? IT pros uncomfortable with PowerShell? Learn. No, it's really, it, yeah. it can save you so much time. It really can. Um, and pain. As I said, all these scripts will be available. Um, Office 365, you can just spin up a tenancy for free for 30 days. It costs you nothing. Do it, play. If you break it, walk away, build another one. <laughs> I've done it. Um, so we're also going to do our content types in this config XML. Um, now, obviously, we've, we've got this idea of inheritance. And the way you do that in, a, in the content type is by the ID. So um, anyone here not familiar with content type IDs? I'm, is it? Okay. So um, we're using, I've got to remember this now. Um, so this ID here, 0x01, is the content type ID for a list item. When we create a content type based on list item, it appends a set of, I don't think it's actually a true GUI, but it appends a random set of numbers and letters, um, and that gives, you, that gives us our base content type. I then want to do some child terms, or some child content types off of that base content type. So this one, I've just added 0, 1. The next one, 0, 2, 0, 3. Um, if you try and deploy again, it will start moaning about the content type. So occasionally, you have to change the content type IDs. Um, the one content type that we have problems with um, actually, it's the site columns. When you do, I'll go back to the site columns quickly. Um, so there's a GUI for each site column that you need to generate. Um, when I've exported these, I've just used the site column GUIs that SharePoint's created for me. 
if you're using PowerShell, you can just do new GUID. Um, there's a little bit on that in the script. Um, if you're doing a manage metadata field, the first time you do it, it will take that ID. And it also creates a hidden field using the same ID with an appended number. If you then delete that site column and try and run the script again, it fails because it doesn't delete the hidden field. So what you have to do is just append, just change the last letter of the GUID and move it up one. So I think during testing, I, I deployed this field about 20 times and it, it was going one, two, three, four, five, A, B, C, D, E, F. So it's hexadecimal. Anyone not familiar with hexadecimal? No, good. Um, but as I said, you can just do new GUID in, uh, in PowerShell and that's in the scripts. Um, I, I said I was gonna wax lyrical about internal name pay. Um, I haven't got all of the slides that I do all this one on, but the, the demo I, I give is I'll talk about the number of Ivory Coast coffee beans shelled in a year, which to an end user, you know, that's a really descriptive title. But that's what it becomes in SharePoint, which to a developer means nothing. Um, now in 2007, 2010, it was your developer's problem, you didn't care. In 2013, it becomes your problem because you see it in search, you see it in display templates, you see it everywhere. So a couple of things about our deploy script, and again, I'm not gonna to go too deep, it's only a level 200 session. Um, you need the CSOM DLLs. So these are the DLLs that Microsoft provide you to run on your machine to talk to SharePoint. And it's the same CSOM DLLs that will work to Office 365 to um, SharePoint on-prem. Um, so we're using, you actually don't, I don't think you need the runtime one. I think I've left that in there, but you need the client DLL. And because we're doing managed metadata, the taxonomy DLL. Um, we're then going to get some credentials for SharePoint Online. So anyone who's familiar with PowerShell against SharePoint on-prem, generally you ran the, the, the PowerShell on your server. It ran as the authenticated user. You didn't have to do any of this authentication stuff. All of these scripts are running on my laptop talking to SharePoint Online. So we have to create our... Um, credential object. We have to tell SharePoint Online who we are so that it knows what we're allowed to do. The other thing you have to do is the connection between your laptop and SharePoint Online is asynchronous. So when you're working locally on your on-prem farm, you do something in PowerShell, it happens instantly. With SharePoint Online, you have to tell it what you want to do, then tell it to go and do it and wait for it to come back. So especially for people that are new to PowerShell and scripting, that can, getting your head around that can be a little interesting. Um, but once you get, basically if you get an error message that says the object's not been initialized, you haven't done, you haven't done this go and get step. You'll see this running. The last thing to highlight in the script um, is we have to set a field option. And this goes back to that internal name. If you don't do this add field internal name hint, it won't say, despite us saying, this is the internal name, this is the display name, it just won't set that internal name. You'll get the display name. Um, I think it's a bug, personally. I think that should be the default option. If I've specified an internal name, that's what I want as my internal name. Um, it doesn't happen that way. Hopefully that will get corrected in a future release. So, we're going to drop into our first demo. And this is where I pray that... Uh, the internet's working and being kind to us. So I'm in my tenancy and we've just got a very basic team site. As I said, I'm not a designer. Um, so this is our HR site um, and this is literally empty. I've just created a site collection. Um, so if we go and have a look at our site settings and our site column types. So we've got no, I'm going to be adding a group called underscore Evo which will appear at the top here. and we've got no content types. So this is our PowerShell script. I'll just move that down. Just hide the function. So this is where we're gonna tell PowerShell about our DLLs. We're gonna build our context, and then we're actually gonna go and create. So what I've got in our um, site columns and config XML is this collection of site columns. Actually, let me show you that. So this is our config XML, which tells us about the tenancy that we're going to connect to, the admin user that we're going to use, 
No, I don't store the password in the XML. Um, I'm not going to put that up on the screen. Um, I'll manage metadata, and then here's our site columns, again with our good names. And then under the site columns oh, is our content types. So basically, the PowerShell script is just going to go through each of those in turn, connect them to connect into Office 365, send uh, this is a new site column, this is a new site column. It's going to do all of those, then it's going to do the same with the content types. It's this point where you hit F5 and you think, it'll do everything. So this is our prompt. Because I only gave an admin user, and then I said, right, go and get some credentials. Um, this is PowerShell prompting me now. And what should happen, there we go. So it's creating our site columns. If it's going to blow up, this is the one that will blow up because it's our managed metadata. It hasn't gone red. That's a good sign. It's now creating the content types. Sorry, you guys at the back probably can't see that because it's so low. Let's do that. So it's created our base content type. It's adding the sub-content types. And they're all in. That's it. We've just created 12 content types in Office 365 in about 30 seconds and all the, content, and all the site columns. You could do this across 20 or 30 site collections in another four or five minutes. Now, if you're doing that manually, that's three days' work, I think, clicking, waiting, and then you've got all the, well, and then you've got all the fixing of the, of the mistakes. So um, this is why I say deploying into Office 365 using PowerShell and CSOM is incredibly powerful. Um, Chris O'Brien's got a couple of blog posts that take you into sort of the, the first steps. Um, definitely worth having a look at. Um, it's something I'm going to start blogging on quite heavily over the next sort of few weeks and months. Um, I, I can see a lot of power here. And the, the guys in the patterns and practices, they're coming out with new stuff all the time. There's new APIs being developed. The pace of change in Office 365 is amazing. Um, so what we're seeing, so guys like Visa, Yuvan, uh, who's here this week, um, the stuff him and the other guys are pushing out is great. Lots of change. We like it. So, not the longest demo, which is good, because we want to see, you know, we want, we want speedy deployment. Um, so that's our, that's our foundations are in place now. We've got our site columns, we've got our content types. So we're going to start bringing it together. So the first thing we're going to look at is the form manager list. Um, so we're just going to build that in the HR site. Um, the enterprise catalog is a manual demo. Um, and the search enhancements is another manual demo. Um, now, I've, I've got the fourth demo that I was going to do called the app launcher. So we're all familiar with the Office 365 app launcher in the top left. You can add your own links to that. You can add your own applications. It works nine times out of ten. Apart from when I was trying to build this demo, then it failed every single time. It built it quite happily, but as soon as I tried to add it to the app launcher, it was just failing. Um, so Jasper Oosterveld has got a, the whole process blogged. Um, whether it's an issue with my tenancy at the time, I don't know. Um, but he's got it working, and, and so I've got a link to his blog later on. So our next step is we're going to build our form manager. It's just going to be a very simple SharePoint list. Um, it's going to basically, as I said, it's the local entry for the form, and it's a signpost to where the actual form is and controls the behavior. Um, so we're using a, a checkbox field to basically say, should this be in the enterprise catalog? Of course, don't forget the permissions trimming applies. It's search, it's permissions trim. So even if you publish this to the catalog, it's only available to people that can see that form manager list anyway. Um, there is a slight crossover here that obviously if you add it to the form manager list, your users have to have the same rights on the form itself. This doesn't do any of that for you. Um, so we've covered this with the client as a training issue. So these people that manage the forms for their different teams, they understand that if they build a form here, and they apply the form signpost here, those permissions have got to match. If you can read that, you need to be able to read the form. And obviously, if you are adding to a list, they need to have the relevant edit rights to actually be able to add to that list as well. Um, so we're using a form manager list as well, so we can use JS link. So we're going to do some display templates to change the form and function. Um, and we're going to categorize with MMS. Now, that's quite key, obviously, for the enterprise catalog site. And what we're going to do is we're going to basically recreate the getting started page.
but we're not doing it manually. Because again, I want this repeatable across X many site collections. I don't want to be doing this for every single one manually. Um, so we're following the same pattern. We've got a config XML. We authorize against SharePoint Online. And then we process the form manager list. We create the list if it doesn't exist. We add the content types to it. Um, and then we add the views. Now, the, the one thing I'm doing here is I'm automating the upload of the display template into the master page gallery. I'm applying the display template directly to a view in the list. So we're not having to edit any pages here. We're not having to change anything. We're just creating a new view in the list, making it the default, and applying a display template to it. Let's do this. You can see. So it's creating our list, adding the content types. This isn't the most visually attractive demo, I have to be honest. It's basically a series of green lines in PowerShell. It's coloured. There's no red. That's yeah. the red. Absolutely. Yeah, if you see red in this, is generally is the point where you go, oh, God. It's done. So we've created our list in, in our form manager, um, and it's there for us. So if I just go back to our tenancy, uh, because what I didn't do is come back here actually and show you. You just believed me that the PowerShell had actually <laughs> created them. Um, so there's all our content types. If I go back to our uh, site columns, there's all our site columns. And more importantly, look, we've now got our form manager. If we click on the form manager, oh, we've got our list. Let's refresh that page because it's a bit slow. Come on, there we go, and we've got all the behaviours. So. All we've done is we've applied, so we've got this catalog view, which was the new list we created. In fact, if I just go to the demo code, uh, the config XML. So here's our new view. So catalog view, we've set a row limit of 30. We've set it as the default view. So it means that when we build our list, this is the view that's displayed. Um, we've applied the JS link directly to the view. And that talks to the file that we've uploaded, you know, the supporting file. So I've uploaded a, J a JavaScript and a CSS into um, the uh, display templates area. And the, these aren't stunningly massive JavaScript files. I, I think I've commented them well enough for people to understand what's going on. Um, if you've got developers or pay anyone capable of doing HTML, CSS, they can make this look a hell of a lot better than I have. Um, as I said, I'm not a designer. So that's our form manager. We can add a new item, so we get all our content types. Um, my display template view actually removes a lot of the header behaviors that Office 365 does. If you like that idea, especially I do like the change I've made in 365, where when you now click on the new button on the page, you get the content types, rather than having to train your users to go to items, new, drop down, which is a bit fiddly. So. Um, if I was redoing this demo, I'm probably going to add that back in. So that if I've got edit rights, I've got the ability to just click here and go new, rather than having to come and pick my content type down here. Um, but if I create a new list item, you can see it's just a SharePoint list. Um, we've got a URL for where to go to to show the form. And there's also a redirect URL to where to go to after you've shown the form. Working on it. Do you find SharePoint's overly polite now? I think they were aiming for polite, but so those are the two important demos because without that, the rest doesn't work. So the next step is for us to build our catalog in time. Oh, it's going to have to be a quick demo, I think, this one. Um, so we're going to use our Manage Metadata term set. We're going to enable it for navigation. We're going to um, create a new, well, actually, the, the subsite's already created. So I'm, I'm using a publishing site collection, uh, or sorry, a publishing subsite. Um, it needs publishing to be able to use the term driven navigation. We're going to use the content by search web part. So I am using an E3 tenancy. 
If you're not using E3, you won't be able to use content by search. So you will have to use the old search core results web part. You can do all of this. It's just a little bit harder to get to. Um, and we're going to use some search display templates. Um, so anyone not familiar with managed metadata navigation? OK. Um, so basically, we're going to use managed metadata navigation to drive our left-hand navigation. Um, so the URL will start with our base site collection address. If you click on, for instance, business services, the view will change. The URL will initially, the navigation will initially stay the same because we're at the top level still. But the URL will now tag on the term. If you then select finance, the navigation changes to a more localized version. And the URL changes to finance. This is really key because this, this URL is going to drive our navigation and drive the, the results that you see in the page. And the other thing is Manage Metadata, it creates a, so Manage Metadata Navigation creates one page and you edit that template page. It does, however, give you the ability to change and edit a page for a single URL. What it actually then does is it creates a one-off page for that instance only. So in this case, for our HR page, it would create a page in the pages library called HR. And the navigation knows that when I hit this particular term, I'm going to load that page, not the template. So this enables us to put perhaps extra information just on the HR page or the IT page. Maybe set some ideas, of, um, some expectations to our users. So let's build the catalog. So this is the manual demo that I can't script. So it could go wrong. Um, so we've just got a standard publishing site. And I just need to create a new page. Oh, I don't need the ASPX. This shouldn't take long, unless you're waiting for a demo, in which case it will. So we're just going to save that for now. Then we're going to go and look at our site settings. And we're going to go to our term store. There we go. Always lose it. So this is my um, term store for my tenancy. And this is the terms that I, the term set that I've already created. You can see our enterprise forms, our business services, and then if I expand that out, finance. So again, just a simple tax on it to show you that hierarchy. If we click on the, the group, this doesn't show very well, unfortunately, on this uh, screen. There we go. Um, we've got these tabs for the group manager. And the, the one I'm interested in is intended use. So the default is available for tagging. So obviously, we want our users to be able to tag items with these terms. But what we're also interested in is use this term set for site navigation. So this makes this term set available for you to connect to either the top or the side navigation. I just need to save that. I think that's taken. So we go back to our site collection. So I'm in the root level of our site collection. We're going to go to navigation. And our yep, current navigation, we're going to choose managed metadata. Uh, sorry, managed navigation. For this one, I'm just going to do structural, because I don't want to make any changes and remove subsites. Um, so managed navigation. And I'm going to take it off of the default. I'm going to use my term set. And I'm also going to turn off the add new and the create friendly, because I don't want it to affect my term set. <coughs> Say OK. So there we go on our left side, so quick nav. We've got our uh, term sets visible. And the one thing I forgot to do 
in the term store navigation, uh, term, term store management, I need to tell this where to go. So the target page for this one, so I hope I get it right. So what we've done here is we said when you click on a term, go to the page that I created just before at the start of this demo. Excellent. We're not using a catalog item page because don't get confused with what we're doing here with creating an item catalog that SharePoint 13, 2013 allows you to do because it's slightly different. Excellent. So our navigation's in place. Our content types are there. Um, we now need our result source. So when I initially built this demo, um, I just edited the page, added our, our um, content by search web part. And the only problem with that is it wasn't applying any of the display templates. And there's a feature in SharePoint um, where for some reason, if you're using content types, especially child content types, it doesn't like to apply the um, display templates unless you're using a result source. So I'm going to build a result source called Evo Forms. It's going to be local SharePoint. And I'm going to change the query builder. So it doesn't actually apply. So I'm going to leave search terms. Search terms is basically the, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, the Characters, whatever the user's typed in the search box. So it doesn't actually apply to this, um, but it will just be left blank. And we're going to set our content type to be a start with manual value. I'm going to call it Evo form entry. I'm going to add this property filter. Now, this doesn't work at this point. Um, because for some bizarre reason, when I do a content type starts with manual entry, it assumes I mean the content type ID, which is that horrible GUID. Um, so we need to remove the letters ID. Um, we've got our Evo form entry star to show it's a starts with, but we need to put speech marks around that. And if we test that, we should see. So these are all my bulk forms that are sitting in another site collection that I created in Blue Peter fashion. So that's our query. So what we're doing here is we've got a result source that only shows our form items. Um, the other property I need, the other query I need to add to this is also only show it if it says yes on the publication. I won't worry for now because we're running short of time. So we'll save that result source. We've got 10 minutes. So let's go to... No, nope, I want that one. I want site contents, pages. So here's our rent forms page. This is the new page that we created. We, uh, actually, I'm just going to check that in. I need to check that actually our navigation's working. If I go to business services, yeah, I've got that page wrong. Let's have a look. That's not going to tell me. Okay, so where I told the term set which page to go to, it didn't like it. Did I? Right. So it's nice and quick to create, to uh, correct. Oh, oh, the yeah, thank you. Let's give that a go. So my nice useful run sheet notes down here is the one thing I didn't write down. Oh, look, there's a handy browse. Let's do it that way. There we go. Oh, it wanted the full site collection URL. That's better. Note to self, use the browse. It's much quicker. So we we'll go back to our top level. Click on business services. So... I've now got my Ent Forms page. 
And this is that key page template. Changing this page will affect multiple URLs. So that's fine. We're going to edit this page anyway. Um, and it will flash up that page, that warning that I showed you. And we're going to say, yep, yeah, I'm quite happy. I'm going to edit the page template. We're going to insert a new web part. We're going to use content search. And uh, who's not fed up with that picture yet? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make that 30 because I want to show lots. I'm going to change the query. And to switch to advanced mode because I actually want my um, Evo Forms result type. Um, so what that's going to do is that's going to give me all of my Evo Forms results. So we need to control that now by the navigation term because I'm only interested in what I've clicked on. So what we're going to do is in the select filter, um, I can't see it here, so I'm going to do show all managed properties. That will take a short time. Well, that was quick. Um, and it will basically pull in all of those managed properties. This is what I said about internal name pane. If you had named your, for your term badly, this is where you see them. So we're going to go down to OWS because I'm interested in um, form classification. So this is our classification field from the list item. Contains. And we want the site navigation terms of current page and sub pages. If you do the site navigation term of the current page, you'll just get that term you've selected. If you do this one, site navigation terms of current page and sub pages, you'll get all of the children. Um, so you'll get, there we go, OWS, tax ID, form classification, term ID with children. We test that query, we shouldn't get any results because it doesn't know what page we're on. We'll say OK to that. Um, I'm just going to use list with paging, and I've not uploaded my display templates. So let's just save that for a minute. So uh, let's just quickly jump into a new tab. So this is where I should have scripted part of this at least. Um, I'm just going to go directly to underscore. Play templates. Excellent. So we've just got some forms here that need to go into search. Who do oh, it's not going to drag and drop, is it? I love drag and drop, but it doesn't work in every library. Where'd I put that later? There. Let's see if it'd be nice and quick for us. Okay, tell you what, just to save time, I'm not going to worry about doing the display templates. I'll switch very quickly to the Blue Peter demo afterwards. Um, let's just go back into here and publish this page. You'll get the idea. Hopefully. So, by... And that absolutely failed. Brilliant. Okay. So... Go in private and do Blue Peter. So what you would have seen 
is a very nice page card. Let's just remember my login for this site. <clears throat> now this is one that's expired, so I'm hoping it's gonna work. Um, so the next step we were gonna do in the demo is we were gonna upload some, just some nice graphic assets, just to show you how we replace that horrible I'm the visual designer page. Um, and when you click on one of these, we get our business, so we've now, it's the same as clicking on business services in the quick launch. So we're seeing forms from everything in business services. If I go down into finance, um, not a good example, because they're all in the same ones there. Well, I have, let's try distribution. Hacking. There we go. Yeah, so you can see it, that you can basically filter into the result set. Um, so we're absolutely out of time. I will be putting these demos up on my blog in full form as well. And obviously make it the uh, slides will be available to you. The last demo I was going to show you, I'll do that quickly now, is just some of the enhancements we can do into search. Um, so if I do a search in SharePoint, I'm just going to search for monkey because I've got a survey monkey site in there. And we've created what's called a result block. So this is what I'm talking about, steering your users to the results they need. Um, and we're having the same behaviours here. So I'm seeing now a modal dialogue from the search. I'm not having to go to the site. You know, the user's not having to leave where they were. They can have a look at this form. This is a survey monkey form running in a di modal dialogue on SharePoint Online. But to the end user, it just looks like part of SharePoint. So let's quickly flick back to the slides. So what you just very quickly saw in that demo there was the, <coughs> excuse me, the search display templates and the query rules to create those result blocks, which give us, <coughs> excuse me, my voice is going there, um, our result block which says Evo form results, so we can, we can tell the user what they're seeing. Um, they can obviously see the behaviours. We can modify those behaviours, so if you want more information to appear when they hover over a, a, the icon, they can. So we would have seen that one. Um, Adding to the app launcher, this is the link to Jasper's blog where he tells you how to do that. It's quite powerful, I think. Extending that app launcher is going to be quite key for a lot of enterprises. Um, so a couple of related sessions. If you're interested certainly more in depth in search, then Matt McDermott later in this room, excellent speaker, definitely worth going to. Um, for actual more in depth into the client side rendering, the JavaScript display templates, Wes, um, Wes was probably one of the first people to start really digging into display templates. Um, I learned a lot from his blog and it kind of inspired me to really dig into them. And I love display templates now. Everything I do is I, I try and use display templates. Um, there's a couple on the recording as well. Martin Hatch, one of our UK speakers, um, he's very much a dev focus and he goes quite in depth into the dev side of display templates, so definitely worth seeing. Um, and again, another search session by Matt McDermott. Um, a couple of useful resources. If you're editing SharePoint Online JavaScript, I really recommend using Fiddler to, do, to locate a, lo a local file. So you're editing the local file, your Fiddler redirects to that local file, so you're not using the SharePoint Online version. So you can edit that, and you're not affecting any other users. So if you don't have a dev tenancy, you can do this on live carefully, um, but you can do it with live data. Um, and also SPCSR. So SPCSR is a community of, um, group that I set up last year um, after SharePoint Saturday Belgium. Um, and there's a few of us who have all got together. We're basically putting all our display template samples into a GitHub repository. Um, there's a lot of good documentation in there. There's some excellent stuff from Elio Streif and Michael Svensson who are both really deep into sort of the search display templates. They've got some brilliant samples on there. Um, all of my JavaScript JS link display templates for list items are in there as well. Um, and the SharePoint Server 2013 CSOM client components. You will need those if you're going to do any of the kind of the, the PowerShell delivery into Office 365. Um, as I said, they are also available through the Patterns and Practices website, which I recommend you have a look at. Thank you very much. <laughs>